Good evening. Hi. Everyone. Good evening. Good evening. And thank you for having me. We are so, so excited. So hello everyone watching from Facebook and hello everyone watching from our YouTube and everyone watching from Twitter. We're absolutely, absolutely excited um, for this conversation today. I mean, like, I feel like the stars are aligned because August in South Africa, we celebrate Women's Month. And, you know, we have uh, a really great South African literary icon, um, Mayor uh, Sindhu Makona, who is going to join us to speak about her, her latest novel, When the Village Speaks. But I will give Alma, you know, just the... Um, the, the the welcoming the privilege of welcoming uh, our Indeed. esteemed 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 author this evening. Sure, thank you so much. I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Cindy Omagona, who is an author, storyteller, motivational speaker, poet, playwright, and actor. She's received numerous literary awards, as well as awards in recognition of her work around women's issues, the plight of children, and the fight against apartheid and racism. Dr. Omagona recently received the Ellen Kuzaya Award, as well as her third honorary doctorate from the Nelson Mandela University. She lives and works in Cape Town and is the author of When the Village Sleeps, which is the novel that we will be discussing today. So welcome, Dr. Makon. We're excited. Thank you. Just to add a little note, last month I received my fourth honorary doctorate from yeah. Fort University. I must mention Fort <laughs> I mean, honestly. Mm. That's absolutely fantastic. A four, four honorary doctorates. Oh, we have to say. There's no way we have to stand. <laughs> Mama Gona, I, I keep referring back to uh, my children's children and thinking about just the starting line of my children's children, right? And I kind of like, you know, have this um, question out of curiosity. I mean, when you wrote the book, right, you were thinking about like, you know, we may not live uh, enough and ours is a tradition of oral history. And so I want to write these words in order for you to look to them because I want you to know how I lived when I was younger. Reflecting back on writing the book and knowing that like your, your children's children are able to, you know, still drink from the well of your knowledge. How do you think about that book now? Now that, you know, um, you're able to tell them a word of mouth and they can also read it. I, I feel singularly fortunate that I did write the, 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 what will probably end up being the first part of my autobiography. I didn't think I was going to live this long. When that book came out, I was almost 50 years old. Uh, and I wrote everything I knew. I'm not a, a, a uh, I didn't study writing. I write just, as I say in the book, this is my way of, of living word of what it was to be an ordinary, uh, uh, almost painfully ordinary child, South African, uh, black, black, or Bantu as the uh, you know, uh, uh, classification went those days. Because, you know, as a child, one cannot escape being uh, marked by your surroundings. We are all born equal. Yes, human beings are born equal. But from the moment we are born, we are classified by where we are born, who gives birth to us, their situation. Whether you like it or not, you become what your immediate environment and capacity of the people who gave birth you know, dictate, you cannot escape that. So I grew up with this um, idea that I was okay until I ventured out of my little world. That's when comparisons start. Then you realize how. Oh. Until other people don't live like me. I mean, to, the idea of every child going to school in shoes Every child, I mean every child, not just the child of the teacher or of the principal or the child of a mother who happens to be uh, 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 working for white employers and, uh, and uh, sleep in 
who then give their child uh, shoes. Little things like that. And then as I grew older and wanted to, to write something, I thought, well, you start because, of course, your environment also determines the kind of aspirations you, you, are, you may have. And of, of all the things that apartheid did to us, the one of making you believe you are nothing. Because once that belief is inside you, nobody needs to oppress you. You are doing it yourself to yourself because you have so few aspirations. You don't believe you can amount to anything. And so when this idea began uh, coming to me, then of course I stopped myself. Who are you to think you, uh, you can write? You don't belong to any political organization. Who will say you, you gave you the permission to write about black people? As if I'm writing about black people when I'm writing about me. I don't even have the permission to write about me. I need permission from others because our lives, where you live, where you work, the job you can do and all the others you can do, whom you can be in love with, all these were specified. But so now I start giving myself, you know, barriers to what I can do because that's the way I know how to, to, to negotiate life. And then, oh, but your parents are not involved in politics. What are you going to say? Oh, but your parents didn't go to school. What would you think is going to read a book by you? By you. What have you got to say? Until I gave myself through interactions with other people and encouragement, the permission to write about an ordinary person like me who comes from nothing. And that, that's what I wrote. But to be fair, I didn't think, because people often critics compliment me on my two books of autobiography, that because they, they're candid, they're honest. Well, I didn't think those books were going to be read by people who would look at me. So I had no sense of shame. I wasn't hiding anything. I was, you know, when I say at the beginning of the book to my children's children, I didn't mean my biological children, but I knew I did some history. All systems, it doesn't matter how grand, how strong, they will finally come to it. The Roman Empire, that, that empire, cut, they all fell in the end. Apartheid was strong. It looked as though it would go on and on. But I knew that eventually, I thought perhaps in 2000 years, and then those people who go around, who go to university and study and go around digging and finding old teaspoons that were used a million years ago, they would find that, that, <laughs> that manuscript. That was the idea I wrote for posterity. Not you guys who can, how? Can the mom sin will live like that and look at me trying to be somebody now? <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> thank God, thank God I wrote for posterity and accidents deemed, you know, or providence deemed that the book would see the light of day. Now, I wasn't planning on publishing. What did I know about publishing? Whom did I know who had ever published a book and looked like me? Hmm. I, I love that we were having that part of the conversation because in many ways, I, in reading this book, I was also thinking about beauty's gift, right? And so much of this work is women-centered, right? So this is women-centered fiction. And I want to know why you felt that it was important to write women-centered fiction. So you've spoken about telling stories that you didn't think that people would hear, but that really wants us to expand a little bit on women-centered fiction and why you think that is so particularly important for, for your writing and for the people who read your books. I, 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 as I said, I don't come from great learning about writing, but my very first um, writer's seminar or whatever you can call it, conference, after I published to my children's children, I, I was, I was schooled there. One professor, you know, said towards the end of, 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 of the day that 
we although you know he applauded uh, uh, my contribution uh, but he said african women writers black black writers in this country since we started writing way back in 1920 or whatever this is 1998 so this is within living memory in 1990 only five women who looked like me had been published in south africa one two three four five and you could name them bononi jabavu and others and others five including miriam Clyde. Five women had been published. And then he went on to say, but this is uh, true of all Africa, the whole continent. Women writers, black women writers, African women writers will write a book or two, mostly autobiography. And even if it's fiction, it will be autobiographical. Okay? Then they disappear. You know what? I made up my mind right there and there. I wasn't going to disappear. I wasn't going to write two books. I already had two because when to my children's children came out, it had been it had been cut into two. That's where forced forced to grow up. I had written that whole big thing as one, and the publisher then split it, and I had to find a way of wounding the one, you know, completing it as, and then opening the other. And I told myself, I'm not stopping at these two biographies. I'm going to write anything, says she who doesn't know anything. So I started writing. I would write anything and anything. I'll sit down and think this is fiction. Mm -mm, doesn't look like fiction. Then write short stories. Then write plays. Then write poetry. I write because I am, I feel compelled to change that status. And I also wrote because until I was 30, I never held a book in my hand written by a black woman until I read Maya, uh, Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. And then I thought to myself, at least, yes, she's, she's, she's not, but you know what I mean? She looks very close to what I, 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 I look like. And so I thought, we can write if we don't see people who look like us write. I, I, I have a statement I made, it's written in, I think in the book of poetry and elsewhere. I write so that children who look like me in the continent and elsewhere can see someone who looks like their mother and grandmother and aunt who does writing. I write so that women who look like me can write. It's not competition, it's, it's, it's kind of playing at being a role model because whether we like it or not, we are all role models. As soon as you get to be bigger, the ones who are smaller than you look up to you and do as you do. Today, I, I don't know how many women who look like me write in South Africa. I've lost count. And I think to, I'm not saying I, I made them do it, but I'm saying they grew up in an, in an environment, writing environment that's definitely different to what I was exposed to. I really people only that. do as people do. I, I really love that because I think in many ways what you're saying is that the only way we will make it in history is if we continue writing. And that's why you you, you made the decision in after 1990 to be like, I'm not going to disappear like all these women. Um, and in many ways, I think that um, when the village sleeps gives us a, a glimpse of, of what you say, right? Because one of the key things that uh, or the key themes that uh, we were really interested in uh, when we were reading um, the, the, When the Village Sleeps is this idea of communal responsibility um, and just this idea of like the ways in which families fail, we as families fail our children. So we are complicit in a system that seeks to dehumanize Black people, especially, especially as we see in the novel, the idea of dehumanizing the girl child and making sure that the girl child is like pushed to the fringes because there are different standards that we give the girl child as opposed to the boy child. And I wanted you to speak a little bit about that, right? This idea of, of, of communal responsibility or in fact, communal complicity in, in, in harming or ensuring that the girl child is not succeeding. You know, uh, uh, nobody, wiser people, smarter people, more learned people have said this, nobody can oppress you without your compliance, 
we are because you you know i'm not saying oppression isn't real but one transcends it whatever the situation is especially when it's not one you enjoy fight for you fight for yourself nobody's going to do it for you and the girl child is trapped in societies such as ours in what is called tradition and it is a painful thing to realize that men use tradition because it benefits them and even a man who is not aware he is oppressive he grew up in this setting he doesn't view it as oppression and when you point it out say but my father does it like that and because your father did it like that doesn't make it god's law you find professors at university who happen to be black black and 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 and, and you know like me really arguing about the fact that a woman is made for becoming a wife and child bearing say so where is love in this in, you know in equation what happens if you marry her and she cannot give you children or you cannot give because in the african sense is always the wife who is barren is never the, the husband what happens you get married and there's no child that's why we have this team what happens if it's you who can give a child no answer but the fact that you marry somebody till death do us part but if there's no issue you you stop loving her where is love in this that's why we 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 there's this terrible word that has come to be associated with lobola that's why we pay lobola you you don't pay lobola pay came with the coming of money into this into this into our lives you offer lobol you don't pay lobol you are not buying anything you are offering that family who has raised this woman you want to make a wife so that they offer in return their daughter to you and ubuntu had rules regulations that were observed ubuntu the premise ubuntu you know rest solidly on the foundation of umtungumtu kabantu no one is bigger or better than the other one not because they are male or female no and it is the most more vulnerable who were protected by all the rules of ubuntu that lobola didn't give you the right to ill treat anybody's child they would go fetch their child you know now we have discarded the essence of tradition but cling on to what suits us take an example that will make this clear two examples i can use the example of um ukutwala you understand ukutwala Yes, or yes. vaginal inspection those two they are both women you see today because of apartheid africans will say that's tradition and every white person claims because if they say anything against tradition what's their name you racist you ra no it's not tradition traditionally if you had an eye for a woman a young woman you might wanted to make her a wife you didn't make her your wife until you got permission from the parents you may have taken her without permission but you wouldn't wife her you would make her a wife ulale nai until you had gone and reported and be given permission and no gray haired man was going for a 12 year old child that is not tradition children were protected young women were protected sexuality was an open secret 
nobody hid youth you know, youth sexuality was applauded in our traditional settings but young people were schooled in ways of being together with no results we discarded that pursuing the western ways but we are not really there are we mm -mm. we wouldn't be having all these children having children if we did vaginal inspection you sis okay we don't examine why it was done then we are saying our forebears were all fools that means we are the the the, the descendants of fools if you examine what it meant safeguarding the maiden so that she would she would retain her maidenhood until such time as she became a wife again protecting her children what children she would have to have them when the time and place was right okay let's say now okay that's backward that's the, the oh, oh we can't do that we're civilized we're westernized we're christianized how many young people get to be 16 and 18 and they have not had the word gynecologist do you take your little daughters to the gyne no that's the western way that's the western way by the time the, the child becomes a young woman she's been to the to, to the to, to the gynecologist and every year she goes so that her womanly health her woman health is safeguarded when she becomes sexually active, the mother says, hey, doctor, deal with this. We discard ours. We think we are westernized. We don't really know what the westerners do. We are half and half in between. We are neither this nor that. Our becoming westernized is not real. Because we don't know what deep-seated beliefs those people built their own cultures that they are following we abandoned ours for things we don't fully understand i want Mina, to talk sorry, you sorry go Dr. On. i want to speak a little bit about in life what you've said about indigenous knowledge systems i want us mm. to speak a little bit about the exploration that you do in the book so in the book we see how Busi's family almost frowns upon um, uh, Goko's ideas or Maku's ideas around um, rites of passage and and the way in which she feels that Busi needs to be in accidents becoming a, a woman, right? And we see the results of that. But we also see indigenous healing take place or the use of indigenous knowledge systems as it relates to healing because we see how Makulu does Makulu is still here? Yes. How Makulu then helps look after Mandla guys who's considered to be sick and unwell. And, and it's interesting to see the, the interplay of, of indigenous knowledge systems when ignored, but also when used um, for healing and for betterment. And I, I thought that there was an interesting commentary that was being made there about the sort of knowledge that our forebears have that often gets ignored because it's considered to not be sophisticated or not to be useful. And so I want to know what was the purpose of including that, those two particular incidents in, in, the, in the book? Which two particular incidents? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I got lost. <laughs> no, but no, so I mean... Helping. Makulu, Makulu there's, a, there's, a, yes, Makulu, there's a rite of passage um, where Makulu mm -hmm. wants to... Almost okay, to and which is the food. other one? And then you have Mandla, guys, who's born and she's not wild because of all the things that Busi has been doing during her pregnancy. Yeah. And, mm. and Makulu then takes Mandla, guys, home the village, and there's a relationship yeah. with the land and and um with the herbs and the plants that Makulu uses. Yeah. For me, writing the book is to show who we are and where we are and what we have left behind. To remind ourselves, we are never alone. Africans believe this family throughout the continent. We believe in ancestry, not worship, but that 
as a human being, you are never alone. You are never alone. And if we instill this respect for who you are in totality, your family, the living and the dead, we wouldn't do, if we instill this in our children, we wouldn't do a lot of the things we do, a lot of the missteps we do. This belief, if you can think of, say, an aunt you loved who has gone and you knew what she wanted for you, her wishes and hopes for you, you might work harder at school thinking, oh, oh aunt, she must feel good I'm doing this. And um, I want her to look down and behave. You know, we have to extend our our whoness, Ukuba city, our being, so that we realize how interconnected we are, both as living human beings now, but as we are in the in this realm at this time and those before us and those who will come after us. We are linked. Each cohort of parents has an obligation. They receive something from the one, you know, that gave birth to them. All the training, all the learnings, all the traditions, all the wisdom. Now theirs is to pass it on to the next generation. If this is not done, you know, civilization as we know it would collapse. Because when we are born, we know nothing. We are born innocent of knowledge. All we know and all we will ever know comes from those around us. So they had better take that responsibility seriously. Knowingly and unknowingly. As a grown-up, you are always a role model to others. Therefore, it behoves all of us to always conduct ourselves in ways that are exemplary to the people who look up to us, whether we know them or not. How many times have you seen somebody a dress they are wearing or a book they are reading, you don't know them and admired it. And consciously and unconsciously, you take it in. That makes part of who you are. You see, COVID-19 now is reminding us of that. We are drinking in gems from people we thought were far away in China. What's China to South Africa, to Africa? But guess what? One world, one humanity, one race, the human race. Dr. Magona, I wanted to speak about Makuru's friendship with her employer and mm -hmm. wanted to talk about power relations and friendships. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I suppose the younger generation, as us, we are constantly going to say, we don't know if friendship can exist in that sort of subservient relationship. But I wanted us to speak a little bit more about that, about sort of, yeah. as you say, you write the book to sort of, you know, tell us we've lost our ways. But I wanted to speak particularly, what was the commentary that you're giving um, us thinking about that friendship in particular? Because in the book, this friendship is like, it's, it's a real, it's a sisterhood, right? So these yeah. people see each other yeah. through losses of, of their, of, of their yeah. husband, yeah. they connect. Even when she stops working and moves to the village, they still have a connection, you know? And mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about the idea of like friendship across race lines, but also across power dynamics, because yeah. uh, Makulu is now befriending her employer and your commentary around that. This, you know, you write about what you know. Is is, is 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 a common saying that I I've come across as I keep on writing, and uh, I worked as a domestic worker for four years. If you read uh, "Forced to Grow," you will grasp that. And uh, I, I'd be lying if I said I had good relations with the women I with for whom I worked. However, as I grew 
both, you know, as a human being in number of years, but as when I started branching out and growing out of my own ghetto and forming relationships with people differently classified, colored, uh, Asiatic, white, I discovered that no, Ubuntu is not the soul, you know, uh, is not only owned by Abandu Bamnyama. Ubuntu comes in different and skins, skin color. It's not the color of a person's skin that makes them generous or mean. It is what is in the heart, what is in the, in the mind, the, their spirit. And I got to know, I got to befriend, I got to be helped, especially when I was down and out by women who were white. I have friendships now that go over 40, 50 years now with some of those people. I have friendships with black, black women from sub B. And when I look at my friends, it is not their color skin. And I've written a lot about, you know, the, 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 the domestic worker and, and the madam. And it's not been complimentary most of the time. And I thought for a change, <laughs> let me show that, you know, a white woman who employs a black woman can be a human being on Ubuntu who has a good heart. And there can be a relationship that, you know, when I taught the first, the, the only job I ever kept for five years, my last job in South Africa, I was teaching at a prestigious girls' school, uh, private. Yeah. And, you know, that's when things were beginning to change in the late 70s, early 80s. I left here in, yeah. And there were a few black children there in that school and it wasn't cheap it wasn't any old white person who could send their children there and those children were there because their mothers were domestic workers and their madams sent their children there and i know a woman not a close friend but in an organization i was so someone i know who bought her maid long before we could buy immovable property in the in the urban areas in the 80s, a flat in a white neighborhood. Okay, it wasn't in her name, but in her will and her family knew that that flat in which she, she lived there with her children, she was supposed to be caretaking. Nobody said you couldn't caretake and live on the premise, but that even if this woman died, eventually that she was never to be moved from that and her children, if she died, would, would live there. So I've, I've known this. This is something I have witnessed. And I thought, why not use it to show that we shouldn't condemn. There is no, you know, the white people, just like when we were oppressed as black people and all black people stink and all black people are thieves, I used to be very offended. There is, we, we, not just because we wear this color skin, we are not all the same, are we? By the same token with anybody. People are people inside differently colored skins. I want to talk a little bit about the complex relationship that you showcase with aging in this book. So we see, and as a community, uh, we see Umakulu have to flee her, her home in, in the village because there is this almost which feels counterintuitive, right? For a for a culture which claims to treat old people with veneration, you see that there's a continuous dehumanization of older black women, right? So older black women will be accused of witchcraft, older black women will really be continuously subjected to atrocities. And there's a commentary that I think you make about 
the loss of veneration for older people in our in our cultures, but also the ways in which Black women continue to be victimized even in their old age. And I, I wanted us to speak a little bit about what really is quite a disturbing phenomenon that you hear about constantly, and you see it almost happen to to Makub. So there's that there's that community complicity that the Tokonolo was speaking about as well. Because had she not been warned, I shudder to think what would have happened to her and her grandchild. It really is a sad commentary on our inability to grow. Grow out of nonsense. Leave behind what doesn't serve you, what doesn't grow you as a human being. How do you feel after you do that to another human being? Do you feel better? Do you feel taller? Do you feel that you are nearer to your God and to your ancestors? Really, really, this is something we all should be up in arms. I don't know what happened to this. Yeah, I watched something like this last year. Was it early last year? Somewhere, I forget where, in the Eastern Cape. A woman, an old woman being dragged to her house by a relative and being put in there. And a young woman, your ages, pouring in, I think, you know, something like petrol or paraffin. I mean, what do you think we are doing? And the, the pitiful cries, this woman, that, that, you know, that came out of, the pitiful cry, because he knew she was dead. Where is the rest of the, 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 the township or village? When such things happen, they happen with our eyes wide open. When the village sleeps, that is what happens. Oh, wait a minute. When I was reading that part of the book, I was so mad because I was like, now she has to leave everything she has created for herself and mm. go back to a place that even in that place, she may be, it's precarious for her to live in a township where we've heard stories of, older black women who've been violated sexually and older black women who've been killed. Don't remind me, I was in France in June when I read in the news, you know, where you see news on the on the top uh, laptop, a 92 and a 75 year old woman, Ed Tomo in the Eastern Cape were raped. The 75 year old managed to escape. The 92 year old died, was killed or died. Who rapes a 92 year old? And you know, it's not her age mate. It's not another 92. It's not her, her son. Is the son of her son. It's either her grandson or the son of her Amanyala. How mm. do you go and rape a 92? But then, having said that, we are a nation that rapes babies in Layets. Mm. Mm. What mm. is that? What mm. is that? Mm. I wanted to speak about um, sort of the idea of reproductive justice and, and access. So we do see that Busi, upon finding out that she is a pregnant, sort of has to wrestle with this idea of what to do with the baby, because initially she kind of wanted the baby, but then when it, it happens, she's just like, mm, I don't know. And, and I wanted to speak about like your commentary on the idea of like, we live in, in, in a democratic South Africa, where we know that the idea is that people can get free access to abortions. But we know stories of young women who have gone to want to access these services and been chased away. And if they're not chased away by the uh, healthcare workers who are at these, um, uh, the clinics and the healthcare provision, where they also, you know, are treated quite differently uh, by their families. And I wanted to know what were some of the commentary you wanted to make around the idea of reproductive rights and particularly access to reproductive rights? You know, uh, any, at any time when someone else usurps authority that should be yours, you are your own and nobody should tell you what to do and what not to, not to do. Anything and everything that happens to this body is your business and no one else's business. We come from a, a, a system that told us, do this, don't do this, and do this. 
That's one of the reasons I never, even if I could have, joined any political organization. The idea that I must be told or that you can't say this, you know, we must all agree. Even if I don't agree with the thing, we must speak with one voice. Where is my own faculty? Where are my faculties if I must just keep quiet so we can speak with one voice? If I even, when I see that this is wrong, I must have the right to dissent. The right of to decide for me who is me and what I'm about should not be violated. You know, what you're talking about it ties in with this idea of you are just like, like vegetation or, or vegetable, a cabbage. Someone can buy you, someone can say, okay, I'm the Nikim Dana, go, I'll take another one. You are, you are nothing. You are a soul. You are a soul and a, a brain. You should make your own, which is why it, to come back to Kulu, children, both boys and girls, but we we'll talk about the, child, the girl child because she's the one who carries the baby, should be taught self-respect and self-love so that they learn to look after themselves and they learn to do for themselves and they learn, you know, the idea that is still pervasive to this day, unfortunately, that there will always be some man who will love you enough, love you forever, that they will look after you. We should, we should scrub that out of our minds as women and our daughters. Be as big, as tall, as strong as you can be to look after yourself and whatever children you might decide to have, whether you are married or not married, because guess what? You may be more fortunate, wiser than me, and choose well when it comes to men and find a loving husband. But even good husbands die. <laughs> then what? When you decide to have children, it must be at a point where you know you are able to look after those children all on your own. If you have somebody helping you call the husband, well and good, then the child has more. But if the husband disappears, you must be able to look after your child. Whether the person there pays non-support, you know what, your child should be your business. It's, it's okay to have a partner. It's lovely. Don't bank on it. I want to, so speaking of children, I want to speak a little bit about Mandlaga as, as a character. I, I found mm -hmm. Mandlaga to be quite intriguing. Her entry into the world is marked by a lot of conflict, a lot of unhappiness, but also Mandlaga herself is a character who's quite interesting. She has a physical disability, but she's incredibly intelligent. She also has the ability to in some ways or she has supernatural powers that are also linked to to her ancestors or to her ancestry so it's also very spiritual but mandlagazi without giving away too much of the book mandlagazi's character in the book and sort of the way that the book ends is a little was a little bit disturbing for me as as a reader and um maybe i'm just a the eternal optimist and I just wanted things to be perfect. But I felt that Mandlaraz had had such a difficult life. She had a difficult start. Mandlaraz's life also just revolved like so many black women's lives around helping other people. And yet Mandlaraz doesn't necessarily get what she deserves. I don't want to give away too much of the book. That's what and you I think. That's <laughs> what you think. Wait for the sequel. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll say, yeah. I'll say that because I, I was happy with how Mantalazi's how story in the, the book progressed without giving away too much. And I want to know why you wrote Mantalazi in the way that you that you did because she had many facets to her. I mean, we see generational trauma, we see complex mother daughter relationships, we see uh, a physical disability. There are many things that, that Mandlagazi sort of overcomes, I suppose, if, if that's the, the word to use. Can you see this part of the book? Yes. Did you read this part here? Is this so at the beginning, Mama? Eh? 
Is it uh, to the community? Where it says part one, the page which says part one. We don't have any. Oh, yes. Yes, now yes, read yes. the opposite at the top. This the writing of this novel was made possible by a bursary from the National Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences to do a PhD in creative writing at the University of Western Cape. Ah ha ha. Ah ha ha. That answers. <laughs> you know, if you do that kind of academic stuff. Mm. <laughs> The sequel, the sequel to this one will answer some of the, the queries you have. Okay, I'll take I'll take that because I have many queries. Dr. Makot about Mantra guys. Right? Yeah, please, you know, write them to me, send them to me, it will help me. <laughs> but I think I'm interested in Mantra Gazi's relationship with her mother, particularly with Busi, right? Yeah. Because yeah. I think that that relationship is a site of redemption almost for, for Busi. So we see the mother-daughter relationship almost come full circle because there's a, there are ways in which Busi is humanized as a person outside of being mother that, that you do for her and that also changes her relationship. And I want to talk a little bit about the mother-daughter relationships in this book and why it was important for Busi and Mandlagazi to have a, a redemptive arc because there is a redemptive arc and there's a healing arc that takes place in, in, in that you. relationship. Thank you very much. Because when I was planning the novel, I knew as I was looking at the characterization that Busi was going to be for me the most challenging. <laughs> the most challenging. I didn't want really her to was. end up. Eh? But she really I didn't was. Want... Like, I felt like I needed to strangle her at some point to be like, Busi, <laughs> Busi. <laughs> I didn't want her to, to end up being almost satanic you know what i mean so i i thought i must find a way to salvage her what better way than through the mother daughter especially as mandlakazi is ancestral spiritual let me and this also is a um, is a learning for all of us that I used to say when I was younger to friends, you know, the, kin the, 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 the kind of friendship where you find friends have stopped talking to each other. I used to say, Mina, I don't care what I've done to you. If I didn't sleep with your husband, if I di you didn't go to the witch doctor and they said, I, 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 I'm the one who murdered your child. Hey, what is it that we cannot talk through and forgive one another? Really, I didn't murder anybody in your family. I didn't sleep with your husband. He nearly that you cannot forgive. What is the word forgive? You're going to forgive me for doing right things. You cannot forgive me for little mistakes. I forgot your birthday. Well, kill me. <laughs> I, I love what you're saying because I think that and this book makes such a good example of, of the ways in which women are judged quite harshly. I mean, the book begins with Wusi being perpetually disappointed by her father, right? No. And, and there's a commentary about the perpetual disappointments that that black children are subjected to at the hands of, of fathers. You know, so I mean, yesterday I read an article about some some ridiculous statistic of the number of black children who are growing up in households where they may not have their father's presence, right? Um, and we see that in the book as well. So Busi's Busi's story begins with the perpetual disappointment. You know, her father is just a perennial disappointment. You can rely on him to be disappointing, and that also sets the tone for some of the relationships. But there is a judgment reserved for the black woman in this book that isn't extended to anybody else. And I think it's so important what you've just said, Dr. Makona, about holding women, black women particularly, holding each other in forgiveness and in tenderness, right? So that the standard for black women's behavior is not almost supernatural and you cannot be human. Because in many ways, you can understand why Busi behaves the way that she does. Busi is a child. She's a child in a dysfunctional environment that continuously strips her of her humanity. And she then goes on to also have a child who presents with 
with a disability and what does that mean for the child that is Busen? I think it's so beautiful that you wrote a healing and a redemptive arc for women Thank like you. Busen that we often Thank don't you. see. Thank you. And look at even when she's being helped by going to this better school, the Model C school, I mean, it, it hurts her. Because you are not just at that school. You have to come back to this rotten and go back there. You are judged differently. Yeah, it's very hard to be a child, you know. And to meet, I, I did, not now during COVID. I, I like to work with young people, children and young people. And to us, a child you haven't seen for three or four weeks over December because, you know, it's holidays. When she, how was Christmas for you? And instead of the joy you want to see, the child starts, I mean, a whole river runs down her cheeks because the father didn't call her. She ha he has another family in Gauteng. He had promised me to send me money. He didn't even call. And when I called, he had blocked my number. I mean, I mean, what is that? The, you know, the woundedness in our children is beyond description i don't mm. have the words to to mm. the woundedness how do you heal from that how do you heal from being denied being denied and discarded like so much garbage by the source of your life yo yo i'm saying pearls of wisdom tonight remote again tonight I wanted to speak. I wanted to speak a little bit about. I think there's a, a there's an important commentary that is made around sort of how we understand the idea of capitalism and how capitalism has encouraged us to be um, these sort of individualistic people who only care about ourselves and care about our well-being. But I, what I think, what the village when the village sleeps does really well is to remind us again that communal care. It's really a response to an anti, it's, a, it's an anti-capitalist practice. It's saying that in essence, what we need to do is we need to constantly be our brother, our personhood and our sister's keeper. That I must be in your business in the way that you are in my business. And only when we are in each other's business are we able to rid ourselves of these you know, capitalistic notions of ah, you are each to their own and stuff like that. And I think the book really does an important commentary we see this, as Alma mentioned earlier, when Makulu is warned, but we also see this when Busi comes about uh, the idea of like uh, the, the, co the, the community girls who come and sit with her and help her and how she also gives, you know, some of her clothes uh, to, to this person and how the, the, the girl who lives in the village is so grateful because she can have further clothing. But there's this idea of just like being in each other's business, you know. I know Gwendolyn Brooks says a lot, we are each other's business. And I feel when we the village... Are. We are. What is the point? Why would I want to have a thousand pair of shoes when my sister is walking barefoot? Really, what does that say about me? If my mother's child is picking food from the garbage cans and Mina, I, I, I breakfast with on Kentucky and lunch on 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 roast this and I'm I'm I've turned vegetarian, I forget now. You know, oh, you know, and when I hear such sickening statements which are not in our language remember that as black text what is black text what is black text how do you translate black text in in what is black text and we should read the biographies of white people, some of them who came here as refugees from Hitler and other. Black text, black text, you see how families helped one another. One brother or sister comes and they all live in one house, you know, with two bedrooms, the girls there, the boys there, the father here, the mother. What is black text? I grew up in an area where there were a lot of, it, all the shops, in fact, were either run by Indians or Chinese. You see a little, a young man come. You could see he was poor. 
He works there. He works like a slave for a year or two or three. You hear he has a shop somewhere. What is black tax? It's just another way of us finding a new way of oppressing ourselves. How do you grow when you don't help your, 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 your own family? And then these are the people we think can help the nation? Mm. If you can have the heart that really frowns on helping your siblings, your, your immediate family, I have no hope you can help me. Dr. Makoda, I want to ask you what you hope that this novel will do. I mean, the title itself is quite intriguing. I mean, we, we often think of, of the village. We get told it takes a village, uh, but the village is sleeping, and we, and we see that the village is quite far from... from I'm Mexico. glad you asked that question. I am hoping young firebrands such as yourselves are going to be the mandlagazis this country needs. People who have no vested interest in government, who will go community-wide and say, it's up to us. Don't blame the fools who, 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 who have done wrong or misstepped. They also have a history. Make the world a better place than you find it. That's what we are. That's our mission in life. I am hoping this might spark a movement where people start thinking about what it is in our culture that we had. Kwazulu, they had Amabuto. We let go of that. Where girls and boys, according to age, were nurtured and, 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 and made to grow in awareness of themselves and their obligation to the whole nation. They won't grow whole if we don't raise them. You want roses? Plant roses. Dr. Magona, this has been a really um, powerful conversation. I think that like it's it's all often you. really um, important for us as, as young children to to sort of have these intergenerational conversation because you know we often come at a at a different angle than 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 our older people. But I think what you really try to do in the book. Uh, when the village sleeps, is you, you you calling us back to each other? You're saying that like Please. we are not so far, we are not so far from each other. We are quite near from each other. The systems that have been created to separate us, we are the ones who are able to. Let's not up. allow it. Let us not allow it. And we, the older, must listen because dialogue, dialogue means listening more than blah, 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 listening. I want to hear your voice. I want to hear your views. And I want to, to really listen and digest and then see why it is I don't see eye to eye with you where I don't so that I can grow. We must never, ever stop growing. And you won't grow if you don't listen. Listen and grow. Thank you for what you do. Thank, Thank you, you so I much. You. Thank you so Thank much. And we're really, we're really excited about the sequel because, you know, me and Alma, we're already there. We're going to jump in the email and be like, okay, Mandlakazi. I need to know what happened with Mandlakazi. I need to know. I, what no, happens. please, please don't. don't I, I want to hear from you. This is a relationship. And I must tell you now, it's not a secret. Somebody, some professor somewhere has started a... Um, in two years, in, in on the 27th, I'll be of this month. This is my birth month. I'll, yes. be, I'll, be, I'll be 78. Yes. You know, my mother was over, giving birth to me on the in, during this month of women's month, anyway. <laughs> and then on the same uh, in two years' time, they want to celebrate my 80th uh, throughout the month of August. But they want everybody who's had anything to do with my journey. So now we are getting added on the list. <laughs> That's really, really kind. Um, thank you. Again, thank you so much, um, Mema. Thank you. I like a thank really you. important 
us to continue to have these conversations. And thank you for just, you know, opening yourself up in the way that you have. I think- No, today, thank you for knowing that there, there is work to be done and being brave enough and be having heart, heart enough to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to everyone watching, um, please go uh, ahead and get Dr. Makona's book. And if you want to get it from the Cheeky Natives, all you got to do is email info at cheekynatives.co.za and we'll make sure that you get yourself a copy of When the Village Sleeps. <laughs> Until next time, Cheeky Natives, thank you everyone for thank joining you. us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.